Come on in, pull up a chair and take a load off because today I'll be reviewing and sharing a bit of a how to play for The King is Dead, second edition from Osprey Games. So is this a case of the king is dead, long live the king is dead? Or should we be burying this game along with the aforementioned late king? Well, you're gonna find out right after this. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, the Grand Pooba of the GamingGang.com, as well as your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. As I mentioned in the open, I am going to be reviewing The King is Dead in just a moment. But first, I do want to mention, if you end up liking this video, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, ding that bell. Because not only will it let you know when I upload videos such as this, it'll also tell you when my live stream, The Daily Dope, airs right here on YouTube, Monday through Thursday nights, as I bring you the latest in tabletop gaming news. So, as I mentioned, we are taking a deep dive into The King is Dead which is from Osprey Games. It's designed by Pierre Sylvester with artwork provided by Benoit Billion. This game is for two to four players, ages 14 and up. It's 14 and up because of the little cubes. That's the only reason, little cubes, discs, things like that. It is not a difficult game to wrap your head around. Anyway, it does take about 30 to 45 minutes to play, and this carries an MSRP of $40. Swing on over to the other camera because I've set up the king is dead. So you can have two to four players. And essentially what's going on here is the king is dead. And the Scots, the Welsh, and the English are all vying for control of Britain. And you're looking to back the winner. Now, you're not going to really have control over these factions per se. So you're actually portraying kind of a, a kingmaker in the background pulling the strings. If you have two or three players, then everybody is kind of representing their own faction. If you play four players, it's actually a team game. So you have two players on one side versus two players on the other side. Simply enough, what's going on is each turn, you have the ability to play cards that will provide you actions. As you go through each turn, you are going to have power struggles, which are these cards here for each of the regions on the board. There are eight regions. There are eight power struggles that are going to take place through the game to determine who controls each region. So what's gonna happen is each player is going to get a set of eight cards. We'll talk about those in just a moment. You're gonna seed the board. So you're gonna start off by putting two blue cubes in Moray, which is the home region for the Scots. You're gonna put two, it's kind of a wine color cubes in Gwynedd which is the home region for the Welsh. And you're gonna take two yellow cubes and put them in Essex, which is the home region for the English. Then you're actually gonna take all the cubes are in a draw bag and you're going to seed the board. So you're gonna have four cubes in each region. So essentially you're only gonna add two new cubes to each of the home regions. Every other region is going to get Four, which I noticed Devin is missing a couple here. So let's just do this. Oops, forgot to completely seed that section. Anyway, so you're going to set that up. You're going to take these discs. These are control markers here. You're going to place them up in the supply. Once you've seeded the board, 
You're going to take all your cubes that are left over in the bag. You're going to put those in the supply as well. You're going to take these three black discs. You're going to put them in the France space because this is uh, discontent. The, the French are trying to get their hooks into uh, Britain as well. In fact, if uh, you have these three control tokens out in Britain, it automatically ends the game and changes how you win the game. So once you've done that, you've, you've got everything set up there for your supply. You're going to take these eight cards that show the eight different regions, shuffle them up, and randomly just deal them out in order. That's why you notice we've got one through four, five through eight running down the side. That's basically showing you these are the order that we're going to resolve these power struggles. Before I get into the actions you can take, I'm going to explain the power struggle. It's pretty simple. So first off, we would be resolving Gwynedd's power struggle, which is right here. And we see we've got two Welsh and two Scots. If nothing happens in this power struggle, this would be a tie and one of the dreaded French tokens would actually be placed here. When you resolve a power struggle, you're gonna take the remaining cubes and put them back into the supply. So that is essentially how you resolve a tied power struggle. As an example, let's take a look here at Essex. Let's say Essex was the region that we were resolving the power struggle. Well, here, obviously enough, we do see that the English have three cubes and the Welsh only have one. So that would go to the English. And we would place that control marker in Essex. Some of the cards, some of these actions that you can portray or take on, I should say, indicate a little control disc. So as an example here, this is Scottish support. I could take two Scott cubes and place them in any region that's adjacent to a region that's controlled by the Scots. Important to note, whenever you see something like this, especially early in the game, it's like, well, for an example, to start off like this, we don't have any regions that are being controlled by anyone. So this actually represents the home region, which once again, Moray here is the home region for the Scots, Gwynedd for the Welsh, and Essex for the English. So just wanted to point that out with these control markers. But that's in essence how you would resolve a power struggle in that region. The English would control Essex. Once you've resolved the power struggle, you would flip over this card. And I know it's Gwynedd, not Essex. I was just showing an example. You'll flip that card over. So that will go face down. And you know that has been completed. Nothing's going to change in Essex. There's, there's no way that you're going to be able to move forces in there, support in there to change this over. This has been resolved. So essentially what happens is... You're either going to go through all eight of these power struggles to see who controls the breath of Britain, or if these come out and end up, for an example, in this tie, it would get that. Then once these three come out, the game automatically ends. In order to determine who is the victor is going to be if we do the power struggles or if these all three came out, that's considered to be an invasion by France, which you can still win the game with France invading. All right, so we'll get into that in just a little bit, but let's talk about the action cards. So you've got eight cards in your hand. And that's it. That's all you're going to have for the game 
is eight cards. Now you can play as many cards as you want on your turn. Keeping in mind, if you have three cards left in your hand and you have six turns to go, then you are looking at three turns where you don't do anything. So it's important to keep in mind that this is essentially your action selection for the entire game. There is an advanced game that uses some other cards. I've got these over here. I'll show those off when we're done talking about the game. But as an example, so we've got Scottish support, Welsh support, English support. These three cards all do the same thing except for different factions. So essentially it's, it allows you to put two English cubes in a region that is either adjacent to an English control marker or the English home region. So as an example here, let's say I'm the first player, I might play Welsh support. So I would be sitting there looking at, okay, so I want to make sure that we don't have this taking place here with the French disc coming in. So I might do something like, okay, well, I'm going to put it in Devonshire, or I should say Devon. It's not Devonshire, it's just Devon. And then I had those two. That'd be my move. And now what I'm allowed to do is once I've taken my action, I'm actually going to take a faction cube off of Britain. So I would do bink. And this goes into my own area here. This, this basically shows this is the support I have in my faction. And as strange as it sounds, let's say maybe I'm looking hopefully that the Welsh are going to win. Of course, I will want to take the Welsh. But when you take a cube, granted, you're actually gaining favor with this faction, but you're making them weaker on the board. Very interesting little wrinkle to the way the game plays. It's, it's pretty interesting how that happens. Anyway, so give an example. Any of these you're basically looking at, you're adding two of that faction either to the adjacent to the home region or someplace that there's a control marker. Those are those three different cards there. We have, let's get those out of the way. We also have assemble, which allows you to take one cube of each faction, place them on the board. You can put them all in the same spot if you want. You can put them in different locations. It's however you want to do it. So as an example, you could do something like... That's completely legal to do something like that. We also have another assemble card. So we have two of those. We have maneuver, which allows us to swap any faction for another faction. So as an example, let's go back up here. Somebody could play this if they wanted to make sure that we didn't end up having, let's get rid of those, go back to the beginning. Want to make sure that we don't have a tie here, which would put a French disc on that. I might do something like, okay, I'm going to play maneuver and I am going to swap that for that. Now, the next player who comes after me playing a card cannot undo that maneuver with a maneuver card. There is another card called Outmaneuver that they could do that with, but they cannot follow my maneuver where I've swapped the factions by swapping them back with a maneuver card. Same goes for Outmaneuver. Outmaneuver allows you to swap two for one. 
So simply enough, I could do something like, um, let's go like so. That would be an out maneuver. And we have negotiate. So these cards running down the side are the regions in the order that the power struggles will be resolved. So you know right away what's coming up. So if it's like, okay, so I'm, I'm really trying to back the English here and I've got Essex coming up fifth, I can play negotiate to actually move them around. So I could say, okay, um, I'm going to play negotiate and then I'm going to flip these. So I might make, suddenly now Essex is the first power struggle that we're going to resolve, which would end up with an English victory if it stayed like that. And of course, remember, once I would play any of my actions, I also will take one of the cubes from the board. When you do a negotiate, every player has a white disc. They place it on top of one of the cards just to show that, yes, there's been a negotiation, you've played it, and that is the negotiated card. In essence, that's it. That's how you play the game. There are a lot of cool little wrinkles to this game, though. So it's not just really simple to just dive in and play this well. I'll tell you that right off the bat. Uh, there have been a couple of players, part of the gang, who were kind of confused with what was going on. And they thought, first off, they thought that once they played all their cards, they were going to shuffle them back up and get them back as if this were some sort of like a deck building game. <laughs> it's not. So you know off the bat, you are going to have eight actions you can take. There are going to be eight turns in the game. So it's very possible for you to decide to play a card, take the action, take your, your faction cube off the board, Next player says, okay, they do an action. Next player does an action, comes back to you. You say, I'm going to pass. That's fine. Goes to the next person. Up until everybody passes, the turn is still active. Once everyone has passed, then you're going to move to resolving the power struggle. So as an example, you would do that. Take these off. There we go. If everything stayed the way it is, Northumbria would actually go and be a French disc. Warwick would be the Scots. And you're just going to continue doing that until either all three of these French discs are on a region, on regions, I should say, or... You've resolved all the power struggles, and all you have out here are control disks. Once that happens, you will go and you will take this card. This is the coronation card. And you're going to look to see, okay, so who has the most regions? Whoever has the most regions is going to get first. Whoever's second and then third. You also have a tiebreaker. So it is very, very possible for two factions to have the same number of regions. So what happens there is you're going to actually take a look to see which of those had the last resolved power struggle. And Whoever won that resolved power struggle breaks that tie and gets first place or second place, what have you. To determine who wins would be who has the most cubes of that winning faction 
in their supply, in their court, their court favor, basically. So in a situation you might have, because you should end up with eight cubes. So something like this would be, so the fact faction that I had the most influence over were the Welsh. And then a tie for the English as well as the Scots. Now in a situation where the French actually invade, say for an example, we did this. Now what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a look at the cubes of support that you have and you're gonna make sets. So as an example here, that'd be a set there. This is a set here. These are left over. Whoever would have the most completed sets would then win the game. So kind of interesting how that works. So you have to pay attention to what's going on on the board because if it looks like it's possible that the French are going to invade, you want to start looking at having sets of these faction cubes. So kind of interesting how that works. So there's also an advanced game. And the advanced game includes uh, an additional 12 cards. All right, what did I do with them? These are some of them. <laughs> These aren't all of them. <laughs> but probably over here. Yep, there we go. Uh -huh. Yep. So what will happen here? And they're, they're all different actions. We've got Spy. We've got Suppress. We've got Aid. We've got Quell. We've got Plot. March. Edict. Ambush. Resist, muster, and dispute. So what happens here is each of the players are going to discard at the beginning of the game, they're going to discard their support cards. So their, their Scott, their English, and their Welsh support cards are tossed out of their deck and replaced at random with three of these cards which is pretty cool. I definitely like this aspect as well because now you don't know exactly what actions are available to your opponents. Now, as you play, when you play your actions, you're gonna have a discard pile and you're only going to have, you're only gonna show the last action that you played. So once again, Something else where players at the table kind of have to pay attention to what their opponents have been doing and what actions they have played so that they know what they're doing and be like, oh, well, okay, so I know Bob over here, he can't counter what I just did because he already played his maneuver and outmaneuver cards. So it's something you want to keep in mind as well. All right, so in, in essence, it's basically... Whoever has the most sets, if the French invade, and if the French don't invade, it's whoever has the most influence cubes of the winning faction at the end of the game. And that is, in essence, how we play The King is Dead from Osprey Games. So let's swing back over to the other camera. I'll provide my final thoughts as well as a review score. I like The King is Dead. I think it's very cool. It's, it's simple. It's light. It plays really quickly once you get a handle on it. That's the important thing. This is actually a lot more of a thinky game than it might appear to be. One of the things that I really like is that we've got the power struggles. And you can see where are the next power struggles going to take place. We see all in order, although those negotiate cards can swap things around. So you got to be on your toes when you're playing this game and you have to kind of understand the concept of when do you maybe want to use a couple of actions in a turn as opposed to just taking one action per turn. 
I mean, you can play all every card you want in your first turn, and then you're going to sit there and do nothing for the rest of the game. <laughs> Except watch everybody else doing stuff. But I mean, that is completely legitimate for you to do. You're not going to win playing like that. So I love there's all these little balances there. I like the fact that this new edition, the artwork's cool. The components are really nice. I do want to mention, though, I think this box is way bigger than it needed to be. Here, I'll show you. I thought this was kind of bizarre, right? So here's the insert. Oops. As the little plastic baggies fall out. So here's the insert. I'll try to kind of angle it maybe so you get a little shadow on it or something so it's not just white <laughs> but we've got uh the cards here and we've got the cubes and the discs going here and then of course the board folds over it <sighs> gotta be honest this could have been a lot smaller because it's like <laughs> it's just all box that said this is a good game i really didn't like i really did enjoy playing the king is dead the gang did too uh outside of there there were a couple of players a couple of times it took them a while as i mentioned during the the how to play it took them a minute to realize hey uh these are all the actions you get for the entire game <laughs> this isn't you get to play all these actions shuffle them up get them back again no it's that way the game would take forever to play so I dig The King is Dead. So on a scale of 1 to 10, I give it a very, very solid 8.5 out of 10. If you like light strategy games that have a little more going on under the hood, then it looks like you definitely owe it to yourself to pick this game up. It is that good. All right, so that's it for this time out. Once again, let me remind you that if you like this video, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you subscribe, ding that bell. Because not only will it let you know when I upload videos such as this review, it'll also tell you when my live stream, The Daily Dope, airs right here on YouTube, Monday through Thursday nights, as I bring you the latest in tabletop gaming news. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. Yes, we are in our 11th year at thegaminggang.com. Be sure to get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. All right, and as I close out all of my videos during this never-ending pandemic, let me once again hope that all of you out there are being smart and staying safe. Oh, you're still here. Well, once again, thank you very much for watching this video. And of course, if you'd like to subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel, click right here. And of course, if you want to see one of the latest episodes of the Daily Dope, click right on up here. And if you want to roll the dice, take your chances, see what YouTube thinks you might like from the channel, give a click right here. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. And I'll see you next time.